will learn about the DNA and RNA estimation by sugar measurement method. DNA and RNA is unanimously present in all living organisms. In 1868, Mischer found the presence of nucleic acid in the past cell bandage. But interestingly, he named it as nuclein. After that, in 1880, Fisher found the presence of purine and pyrimidine bases inside the nucleic acid. In 1889, Altman coined the term nucleic acid in spite of nuclein. In 1910, Levine found the presence of deoxyribose as well as ribose sugar as components of DNA and RNA. Nucleic acid is actually made by nucleotide component, right? Nucleotide means nucleoside attached by phosphodiester linkage. And nucleoside is nothing but sugar plus nitrogenous base. This particular sugar may be deoxyribose sugar or ribose sugar. And the bases may be purine or pyrimidine. Now, purine bases may be adenine or guanine and pyrimidine bases may be cytosine, uracil and thiamine. In case of DNA, we find the presence of thiamine but that particular base is replaced by uracil in case of RNA. In case of DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose and in case of RNA, the sugar is ribose. This is the general structure of DNA and RNA. DNA is double helical, double stranded structure, but RNA is single stranded structure. At two prime position, no hydroxyl group is present in case of DNA. That's why it is called as two deoxyribose. Deoxy Very good. And in case of RNA, we can find the presence of hydroxyl group. That's why it is called ribose sugar. In 1953, Watson and Crick proposed the double helical structure of DNA. Types includes ADNA, BDNA, ZDNA. So these are the basis of DNA. This is the structure of two deoxy ribose sugar because at two prime position no hydroxyl group is present but in case of ribose sugar in RNA the presence of hydroxyl group we can find. This is the general structure of double helical DNA according to Watson Creek model where you can find the stacked bases as well as the double helical structure. Here are the interesting types of DNA. ADNA, BDNA and ZDNA. BDNA is the common type of DNA. A and B DNA, they are both right-handed, but ZDNA is left-handed, zigzag orientation, right? BDNA is quite normal, that is found in case of all living systems, but it varies according to peach and rice from the A DNA. Ma'am, what is the difference between the three different types of DNA? Three different types of DNA varies according to alignment, according to structure, according to P rise, according to turn prior rise, etc. But they also can be synthesized. ZDNA is actually synthesized one, but A and B DNA is naturally found. Before going into the detail for DNA quantification, you have to know the sources and the extraction procedures of DNA. As I have told you, the DNA is unanimously present in all living organisms, including all tissues and cells. So any living cell can be taken as the source for DNA extraction. So DNA can be extracted from plant leaf, seed embryo, can be extracted from human blood, sputum, semen, etc and from bacteria and fungal source DNA can also be extracted. In case of bacteria, you can extract the chromosomal main DNA as well as circular plasmid DNA. But in all the cases, 
the interesting point is there the strategies of extraction varies according to the source because in case of plant and fungal dna polysaccharides are attached to dna right so we have to apply ctab reagent right and in case of bacterial genome or bacterial plasmid dna isolation you can use sds sodium dodecyl sulfate lysine buffer etc and ultimately in all the cases irrespective of the source dna is getting precipitated by acetate salt and ethanol and ultimately the precipitated dna can be dissolved in te buffer tris edta buffer so this is the dissolved dna in your ependorf in in vitro form before going into the detail for the dna quantification you have to have the idea about the significance of dna quantification why do you need to quantify the dna because quantified dna is needed for several biotechnological purposes for dna profiling dna fingerprinting the dna quantification is needed so by dna profiling you can assess a particular population right to provide genetically modified organism you need the quantified dna and in case of transformation cloning you need the quantified dna dna is needed for forensic purposes dna is needed for the parental diagnosis as well as disease diagnosis so in all the aspects you need quantified amount of dna until and unless you don't quantify you cannot take for dna fingerprinting purpose you cannot take for any other research purpose so we must need the quantified dna quantitative dna estimation can be done by uv spectrometry as well as colorimetric method dna has heterocyclic bases and you know heterocyclic bases means the resonating structure is there right pi bonding is there by which it can absorbs light at the uv range dna has absorption at 260 nanometer bases are stacked inside those particular bases absorb light lambda max at 260 nanometer and it is the general formula that one od at 260 nanometer corresponds to 50 microgram per ml dna concentration so if you have any optical density observation from spectrophotometric method rather uv spectrometric method by putting in the formula you can calculate the amount of dna present in this way the purity of the dna is also checked during the research purposes this particular colorimetric method was first proposed by dishes in 1930 he talked about the dna acid hydrolysis but he set up very huge temperature at around 1000 degree centigrade but the thing was modified by buttons in 1955 he actually reduced the reaction environment by which it can be done in the normal procedure so let's start with the colorimetric method to characterize to estimate the dna where the deoxyribose sugar is present because in case of uv spectrometric method we are quantifying dna by exploiting the property of purine pyrimidine bases okay but here we will exploit the property of deoxyribose sugar we are giving very harsh acid treatment along with heat treatment right so the glycosidic bonds by which the bases are attached are clipped right so the nucleotides are depurinated the phosphodiester links are also broken and deoxyribose sugar come out this particular deoxyribose sugar is acid hydrolyzed and is converted to omega hydroxylevulinic aldehyde and these omega hydroxylevulinic aldehyde along with diphenyl amine reagent develops intense blue coloration which can be measured at around 595 nanometer by spectrophotometer you can observe the production of blue color 
I will show you also the production of blue color by DPA reaction with DNA. So, this is the reaction scheme that I have already told you where by acid treatment the deoxyribose sugar is getting hydrolyzed and ultimately omega hydroxy levulinaldehyde is getting produced and along with DPA reagent it is developing an intense blue coloration. They are the main players. You can identify the main players like deoxyribose, diphenylamine reagent and this one is hydroxy levulinic aldehyde. So, they are the key players to develop such blue coloration. Let us talk about the requirements or reagents needed. First, the diphenylamine reagent. You have to take 1.5 gram of diphenylamine, dissolve it in 1.5 ml of sulfuric acid, very hazardous chemical and you have to make up the volume with 100 ml of glacial acetic acid. So, we have to give acids together, sulfuric as well as acetic acid. This is standard DNA. We need to have standard DNA because standard DNA is taken to compare with the natural DNA. So, method involves two things, acid hydrolysis with heat. So, we need water bath to do so. This is water bath and after development of color with diphenylamine reagent, you need colorimeter or spectrophotometer which can measure the visible blue color at around 595 nanometer. We can adapt two processes. In process 1, single standard can be taken along with unknown one, single standard can be treated with diphenylamine agent and the OD or optical density can be measured or process 2 which indicates the series of standard preparation. You can observe here from master stock series of standard DNA are prepared. So, for having these series of standard, you can easily plot a standard curve. We have to follow these particular working table where 1 ml of standard DNA is taken. It is mixed with 2 ml of DPA solution. In case of unknown DNA, we are taking 1 ml of unknown DNA and we are mixing it with 2 ml of DPA solution. And remember about the blank where we are not giving any DNA solution, just we are making the reagent blank by giving, by adding just 1 ml of water. Otherwise, you cannot compare, you cannot eliminate the background noise. So, by having series of standards and measuring their optical density, you can construct a standard curve having OD at 595 nanometer versus concentration in milligram per ml. So, that will construct a straight line. Now, putting your value of unknown concentration, you can put the OD of the unknown one and by extrapolating, you can calculate the concentration of unknown DNA. So, in this way, by having series of standards, it is easy for you to calculate the unknown concentration. Another procedure that is actually the gross one, just by having one standard, by measuring the optical density of that particular one, you can compare it and by unitary method, you can calculate even the concentration of the unknown one. But again, I am telling you, though this is time saving one, this is very gross method. So, you have to prepare the series of standard that is statistically more valid. So, you can construct a particular standard curve from where you can put your unknown value and by extrapolating, you can have the concentration of unknown one. According to specificity and sensitivity, this particular reaction is very much specific because in case of plant DNA, very small amount of DNA is present though it can be detected by this diphenylamine method. Another interesting thing is there, 
absorbance of a particular DNA at 260 nanometer divided by absorbance at 595 nanometer by this diphenylamine method must lie in 4 is to 1 ratio. Obviously, it has some disadvantages as well as advantages. As advantage, I can say it is very easy to perform, very sensitive, very specific, but still there are some disadvantages. The disadvantages include your handling very hazardous chemical, glacial acetic acid as well as sulfuric acid. You must take care of this. And this is very interesting point, you know. The purine nucleotides is sometimes much more susceptible to acid hydrolysis rather than pyrimidine nucleotides. So, it is thought that the purine nucleotides is actually acting here. But we can nullify these points because we are having the same standards. So, same thing is happening with unknown as well as with standard. But we have to keep this point in our mind that purine nucleotide is much more reactive by this particular method. So, we are handling the acids we must take care of and the diphenylamine reagent is very much light sensitive. So, we have to cover them up with certain measures because otherwise it will give the faulty results. In 1939, the protein synthesis from RNA was found, but in 1959, Ochoa found the RNA synthesis. In 1965, Robert Hole sequenced the yeast tRNA. In 1967, Carl Woos found the catalytic activity of RNA that is called ribozyme. Walter Fears, who found in 1976 the sequencing of total fat genome made by RNA. Till days, RNA is needed for the antisense application as well as various other aspects. The components includes the ribose sugar as well as bases. You have to know that in case of RNA, in spite of thiamine, we find uracil. And interestingly, in tRNA and rRNA, you can find various modified base as methyl cytosine, pseudouracil, etc. RNA structure is single stranded and there are mainly three types mRNA, tRNA and rRNA, messenger RNA, transfer RNA as well as ribosomal RNA. This is the general structure of RNA and you can follow the presence of phosphodiester linkage. In RNA structure you can find the presence of ribose sugar. So at 2 prime position hydroxyl group is there and this is the uracil base that is not present in case of DNA. So, by transcription from double stranded DNA, you can follow the production of single stranded RNA with the help of enzyme RNA polymerase. It is called transcription. This is the secondary clover leaf structure of tRNA. Again, before going into the detailing of RNA quantification, you have to have the idea about the source and extraction method of RNA. As RNA is unanimously present in all living organism, so you can choose any one of the biological source for RNA extraction, but you have to remember about RNA's contamination because our hands are also contaminated with RNA, right? So to avoid RNA's contamination, you have to use dipyrocarbonate or DEPC treated water. That will actually help you to avoid the RNA's contamination. It may be either qualitative or quantitative method. Like DNA, this particular RNA can also be observed by agarose gel electrophoresis, but the position of RNA band is different from the position of DNA band. Quantitatively, RNA can be measured by UV spectrometric method as well as the colorimetric method. 
before going into the details for RNA quantification, you have to know the significance of RNA quantification. Why you are quantifying RNA? The quantified RNA is treated against some particular disease. You know for a particular disease, some proteins are responsible. The proteins are getting synthesized from mRNA, that is called sense RNA. And you are applying antisense RNA from outside, the quantified antisense RNA. That particular antisense RNA goes and binds with the sense 1 and inhibits the sense 1 to produce the protein which are responsible for the disease condition. So that is why we need the quantification of RNA. RNA has lambda max at around 254 nanometer, but at 260 nanometer it also has absorption. Interestingly, you can find in case of DNA, the bases are stacked inside as it is double stranded. But in case of RNA, as it is single stranded, they are opened and exposed. So it can absorb much more light at OD260 nanometer than that of DNA. So when DNA is getting converted from double stranded to the single stranded one, huge increase of absorption occurs. That is called hyperchromic shift. You can observe the cooperative curve. So that is why RNA has higher absorption at 260 nanometer lambda. And you can follow one OD at 260 nanometer for RNA corresponds to 5 microgram per mLA concentration. First in 1902 Bals have proposed the Orsinol method to quantify RNA by colorimetric method. But Kameli and Manhuri actually in 1968 have modified the method. What is actually done here? Again, we are exploiting the property of ribose sugar. By acid hydrolysis, we are depurinating, we are dephosphorylating, we are just only having ribose sugar and this particular ribose sugar is getting converted to furfural derivative which along with orsinol produces green coloration. This sort of green coloration is getting produced here. Ma'am, what is the name of orsinol? Yes, orsinol. Orsinol is 3,5-hydroxytoluene. Now, interestingly, you know that orsinol can also react with deoxyribose sugar, but it produces hydroxymethyl furfural derivative which produces yellow brown coloration, not green coloration. That is very interesting point. This is the reaction scheme that I have already told you. Acid hydrolysis with present of heat. They are the key players. The ribose sugar, your orsinol as well as furfural derivative. In spite of only orsinol and acid, we also use ferric chloride or cupric chloride to make orsinol reagent because they has catalytic activity. They can enhance the reaction, they can act as oxidizing agent. So when we are preparing orsinol whereby taking 200 mg of orsinol, 6.1 mg of cupric chloride can be taken and 100 ml of HCl will be applied to make up the volume. And here also we need water bath, spectrophotometer, etc. Orsinol is also commercially available. This is standard RNA, otherwise you cannot compare it with the unknown one. We are acid hydrolyzing the ribose sugar. We are converting it to the furfural derivative and we are coupling the furfural derivative along with orsinol and we are producing the green coloration which can be measured by the spectrophotometer. In process 1, just gross one standard can be made and we can compare it with the unknown one. In case of process 2, you can make series of RNA concentration from the master stock, maybe 2 mg per ml or 0.2 mg per ml. You have to follow this working table. So what you have to do? You have to take 2 ml of RNA solution along with it you have to take 2 ml of orsinol solution and keep them at 90 degree centigrade for 15 minutes. Again, 
along with standard along with your unknown one you have to take one reagent blank where you are not giving any sort of RNA you just adding the water that is actually your reagent blank that will actually help to eliminate the background noise if it is getting produced by arsenal or not without any reagent blank you cannot perform any spectrophotometric analysis where we are having the series of standards you can make a calibration curve at one axis optical density at 660 nanometer on other axis concentration of standard rna in milligram per ml so that one straight line you can have right don't pass it through origin by putting the od value of unknown one you can extrapolate and can derive the concentration of unknown RNA solution. Where we are taking just one standard, again by unitary method, you can calculate the concentration of unknown one. The reaction is very much specific, easy to perform and here also you can detect the protein contamination by taking OD254 divided by OD280. OD280 means the absorption by the protein moieties and if the concentration is much more higher you can dilute it with n-butanol and xylose can also serve as the standard. You have to take care from the acids. There are advantages as well as disadvantages. Advantages include the simplicity, specificity etc. But disadvantages again includes that fact purine nucleotides much more reactive rather than pyrimidine. But the problem can be nullified by having same standard as well as unknown, treating them same. And we are dealing with hazardous chemical acids. You have to take care of. So students, that is all about DNA and RNA estimation. If any unknown DNA is given to you and if you are asked to diagnose its parental origin, what you have to do? You have to first quantify it with by OD 260 nanometer. Then perform this diphenylamine reaction. You have to take OD at 595 nanometer. Take the ratio. It must be 4 is to 1. Then take 200 nanogram of DNA from here. Then apply it for DNA fingerprinting study. It may be RAPD analysis, RFLP analysis by which you can compare it with the parental origin. In this way, in forensic department, the DNA is quantified and they are applying for the DNA fingerprinting assay and by which we can find the parental diagnosis as well as some cases. It will give you the idea about disease diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thank you.